afternoon. I am Alana Cohn Kennedy, the Chief Operating Officer at the Holocaust Center for Humanity. I'm speaking to you today from beautiful Seattle, Washington, the traditional land of the Coast Salish peoples. Evidence of the Coast Salish peoples dates back to 3000 BCE, and locally, the Coast Salish peoples have inhabited the area along the Duwamish River since the 6th century CE. Thank you all for joining today's Lunch and Learn program honoring Black History Month, and a special thank you to the Northwest African American Museum for their partnership on today's program, and to the Claims Conference for their ongoing support. Please let us know what city you are joining us from and introduce yourself in the chat. Black History Month is an opportunity to talk about and celebrate Black history and to revisit the conversations about race and privilege and the systems on which our nation is built. It's an opportunity to listen carefully and consider how we can do things differently and how we can do things better. As a Holocaust Center, we reflect on the history of the Holocaust to understand our world today. We widen the lens to consider the many experiences of people who witnessed and who were affected by the Holocaust. In 2004, I had the opportunity to meet Leon Bass, an African-American man who served in the segregated U.S. Army and helped to liberate the Camp Buchenwald. Here you see a picture of me in my much younger days in 2004 with Leon Bass, Holocaust survivor Robbie Weissman, and teacher Stephen Paygard in the red tie. Leon Bass was born in Philadelphia in 1925, and as a young man during World War II, Leon volunteered to serve in the United States Army. He said in an interview, I began to question my wisdom for having joined the Army, and I wanted to know why I was there. What the heck am I doing here when I can't get a drink of water, when I can't ride on a bus, when I can't eat in a restaurant? And here I am putting my life on the line, fighting for rights and privileges that I'm denied. In April of 1945, Leon and four others from his unit arrived at the Buchenwald concentration camp in Germany, just one day after it was liberated. When Leon Bass returned to the United States, it took him many years before he could share the horrific and painful scenes he had witnessed at Buchenwald. He later said, do we promote racism through our apathy? When we hear and see things, we say nothing because we don't want to jeopardize that which is important to us, our investment in a job, our investment among friends. We don't want to disturb our family. So no matter what people say or do, we just leave it alone. We sweep it under the rug and hope that somehow it'll go away. We haven't come to grips with that institution called racism, he said. And we have to because we see the ultimate of racism, which was what I saw at Buchenwald. Leon Bass died in 2015 at the age of 90. This conversation about interrupting racism and privilege continues. And at the forefront of these conversations and research is UW scholar and professor, Dr. Relina Joseph. Dr. Relina Joseph is the presidential term professor of communication an adjunct professor of American Ethnic Studies and, and Gender, Women, and Sexuality Studies at the University of Washington. She is also the founding and acting director of the University of Washington's Center for Communication, Difference, and Equity, and creator of the Interrupting Privilege Program. You might find her working as Associate Dean of Equity and Justice in graduate programs in the University of Washington's Graduate School, you might also find her connecting with a variety of organizations who want to grow their race and equity skills. Rulina is the author of three books on race and communication. She is currently writing Interrupting Privilege, Talking Race and Fighting Racism, a book of essays based on her public scholarship, including the work she is sharing out today. In light of this, we ask you all to not take any screenshots of or share externally any of Relina's slides as it is part of the basis of her upcoming work. Relina has received numerous awards and recognition for her work and we are so honored to have her with us today. We will have time for Q&A at the end of the program. Please add your questions to the Q&A feature on Zoom. Relina, thank you so much for joining this program today and I'll turn it over to you. 
Thank you. Thank you so much for that nice introduction, Alana. Um, and thank you so much to the Holocaust Center Seattle for, for inviting me to speak with everyone here today. Um, I am going to go ahead and begin sharing my screen so you can see what we're going to be talking about. So as, as Alana said, I, I run a program that's called Interrupting Privilege, and I'm gonna give you a little sense of it today. We're gonna to have a chance to go through and do a bit of listening together, and also to learn hopefully a couple of skills um, and learn what, is this, what does it mean to really interrupt privilege um, on an everyday basis. And something that I suspect um, by virtue of you all coming to programs like this and supporting the Holocaust Center that, that many of you are already doing. And I'm looking forward to you all sharing some information out in the chat as well. So I'm gonna go through and um, tell you a little bit about the Interrupting Privilege Program. Uh, we are gonna do some listening together. And so for that, you're probably going to wanna turn up the sound on your computer, it'll play through your computer. And Alana will also provide the link in case you're having some difficulty hearing it so that you can, you can go there. You can also listen later to the clips. And then we're gonna just learn, kind of go back and forth, hopefully um, on the chat a bit about things that you've heard um, and ways in which you all might learn a bit from the participants in our Interrupting Privilege Program. And I'm gonna share some of our, our youngest participants' voices today uh, and the things that they are doing to really make the world a better place. Uh, I, I want to provide um, uh, the, the fact that these are difficult, um, a little bit of a warning that these are difficult topics and, and you all, um, you know, are, are familiar with that, of course, um, from Alana's incredible introduction um, and talking about the legacy of the center. And, um, and so, you know, to kind of prepare yourself uh, for, for that as well. So this is this is a little bit about me and what I do. The picture on the right here is one of our interrupting privilege spaces. Um, and part of what what we started off doing so we began in the fall of 2016 at the University of Washington and with a partnership with the Alumni Association. Uh, we were interested in that moment as the 45th president came into office of hosting conversations around race, around race and its intersections, and of bringing people together um, across across race, but also across generation. And so our initial partnership with the Alumni Association was really, really special uh, because we had in particular, there were uh, you, you know um, a variety of ages represented as you can see here, but we had a, a good number of baby boomer folks, of retirees who um, were grappling with the changes that were occurring that fall on um, the unexpected uh, election for many people, the surprising election of the 45th president. And to bring them in conversation with, um, with our young people, with our students um, was something that was very, very powerful. And we continued to have these conversations um, we, we realize that there's also a, a big value of bringing people together who share a racialized identity to have conversations about what does it mean to interrupt privilege. Um, and so we began having those with uh, the Northwest African American Museum um, and, and NAM has been our partner since the inception of our program. And you can see one of our conversations that was happening here in person. Um, like so many places because of COVID, our, our programs have really shifted. We're hoping to move back fully to um, in-person programs. We're doing some hybrid ones and I can share out actually with Alana, we have these listening parties. We're gonna have one um, next month that you all are, are invited to online. And then we'll be doing, for those folks that are in the Seattle area, we are gonna be doing more in-person um, programs to join. These are, these are public programs bringing together community members um, with University of Washington um, students and, um, and some faculty and staff as well. And so just a, a real quick run through, uh, each year of our program has had a different focus. The first year we were interested in um, the first people telling stories of the first time that they experienced racial discrimination. And you see, this is Detective Cookie here, who is um, a local hero in South Seattle, talking about her experiences as a, as a black woman cop with some participants. And this is some of the research outputs as well. Our second year, we were focused on um, mixed race kids, K-12, 
12 and their experiences um, in the classroom. And, um, and so this is part of that, that project where we, we used our same interrupting privilege methodologies and brought in these, um, these young kids. And, and you're gonna, the very last couple here today will actually be two, two participants from this project. This is our third year at NAM, where we were interested in hosting conversations about being black in Seattle. Um, Seattle is, the, um, is uh, not a particularly diverse um, city and um, has a small um, and shrinking African-American population. And so this was the, the conversation prompts were often around things as basic as, as what is it like to be black in your high school? or in these other spaces. And so this is one of our, our, our get togethers. And it said ish because of course COVID hit um, in our third year and we ended up transitioning um, in 2021 to um, a program that we called Quarantining While Black um, and, and looked at the disproportional impacts of uh, COVID-19 and of course um, uh, the murder of George Floyd and the, what became known as this worldwide racial reckoning. And so how people were negotiating those spaces in their own lives. From there, we found that our community really needed to think about how to, um, to have different types of strategies to address their own um, anxieties and um, stressors around doing the really difficult and important work of interrupting privilege. And this is when we partnered with our wonderful resilience lab at the University of Washington and began a project that we called Resistance Through Resilience, um, thinking through what does it mean to partner things like um, mindfulness and self-compassion with the daily work of interrupting privilege. And each time we've had one of these projects, we kind of, we, we, we don't lose the, that group, we just kind of incorporate them into our next set. And so this year is the sixth year of our projects. We have a number of different partners. We're doing a big project on the pandemics at the University of Washington with our three campuses, um, faculty, students, and staff, you know, to, to ensure that we, we are um, memorializing the, the, the con this continuing pandemic. Um, and incorporating those voices there. We have a project that's on race and capitalism, um, and in particular, black capitalism, and thinking through, this is actually a phrase um, coined by Nixon, and um, we were interested in bringing um, business owners to think through what, what, is this, what does this phrase mean to you? Um, and that's gonna be the topic of our, of our uh, next listening session. And then we have this uh, wonderful partnership also with Seattle Public Schools, um, trying to amplify the voices of uh, families um, who have children of color in special education and inclusion. And so this is another project that we continue to work with um, for interrupting privilege. Um, and you know, in, in this in this project, we're we're interested in um, taking people through the cycle of getting them to to really hear differently. So to stop and pause. We're going to practice this together in just a minute. Um, to hold someone's story that might be incredibly different from yours, and. In those moments where you are feeling your kind of discomfort rise, um, perhaps because they are speaking such a different story, perhaps because they are iterating some pain that you don't know how to possibly solve, but that you figure out how to increase your, what psychologists call your distress tolerance as you are holding that story, as you are not listening to respond, but rather listening to just understand. So that's the first step. From there, we move into the phase of dialoguing. So how do you learn how to speak in a really equitable way um, that you don't devolve into debate around uncomfortable questions um, that have to do with things like identity, that you truly engage each other with the purpose of hearing and um, particularly if amplifying those who's, who don't usually have the power, whose voices aren't always heard. Um, and you can see that's why we have a lot of, of projects with, um, with kids in particular and hearing their voices. And then from there, we move um, to the last stage, which is the interruption piece. So after you've learned how to listen differently, after you've learned how to sit with your discomfort, after you've learned to engage in equitable dialogue, that's the moment at which you think about how, how, can I, how can I create some type of action from here? And the action that you create is never something that, that you are thinking about creating alone, but that you're always doing in partnership and in community. So this means that if you are the person who is aggrieved, 
right? You think about how do I not have to hold this burden as I'm creating change? How could I bring in my allies to support me, not necessarily to speak for me, but to prop me up and to provide me with that glass of water as I'm speaking so that I can have moments to kind of stop and to soothe myself, right? And if you are the person, if you are the ally in that situation who wants to help create change, that you're really cognizant of the powers that you hold and how those powers can help to amplify the voice, the needs, the change making of the person um, who is expressing some type of pain. Um, but that you're not speaking for someone, you're not speaking over someone, you're not kind of putting on the superhero cape, but you're thinking about in a very reciprocal way how to create change. So that's, that's a very quick overview of what this Interrupting Privilege Project is. And we're gonna talk a little bit next, um, listen to a story. And um, just so you know, my, my question for you that I'd love for people to include in the chat uh, after we hear is what did you hear? So practicing those listening skills of um, just hearing and holding the story understanding that you might start feeling uncomfortable because of um, the content, because their story is so different from yours, because you want to be able to be the one who's solving the problem, but to acknowledge that feeling and to stay with it and just to hear and to hold the students. Um, so who you're gonna listen to right now are um, two of our high school student participants who came together. Um, this was a, a high school junior and a high school sophomore, African-American students from a large, um, very diverse uh, urban high school. And they're talking about their experiences. You're gonna hear from the male student first and then the female student is going to come in. And um, the prompt, we, the, what we do for these conversations, we bring two people together and we have kind of a, a loose set of questions, but it's a largely self-directed conversation. And so the students have chosen where to go. And um, the basic prompt was, what's it like to be black at your high school? And um, so this is one of the things that they begin talking about. So I'm gonna um, take us to the, clip, you might want to turn the sound up on your computer to just ensure that you're hearing all right. And I am um, going to begin now. Um, Alana, maybe you could give me, or Richard, you give me the thumbs up um, if you're hearing. Teachers actually like didn't even know it was Black History Week. And that's kind of like, that kind of relates to outside of Black History because when like, like I said earlier, when like students have problems or something like that, it's almost like teachers don't care for it because no actions are like, are like acted upon. Like nothing's like done if there is a problem. Uh, like even with teachers, like I know I have uh, a teacher now, I'm not gonna say the name. He doesn't, he teaches to one part of the classroom at a time. And he's kind of like, he, he talks differently when he's speaking to us uh, at different times. And I uh, like, I talked to, I talked to him about it. I didn't, I, I was beating around the bush when I was like talking to him because that's my teacher. Like I have to have him for the rest of the year. Let me just stay on his good side. But um, it was getting to the point to where like, I kind of, I like felt very uncomfortable just like sitting in that classroom. And then like, it just wasn't engaging enough for me to learn. And so it was just like, it was like really awkward. And so like, even when talking to him, I talked to the vice principal about it. And like, they were kind of just saying that I had to like tough it out or like, like just walk it through or like, just like get through it and you'll be fine. And I don't think they understood that like, it's what I was trying to say, which right. is a big thing. There's no like understanding or communicating. Um, do you think at your school, um, if like kids that are white that would stand up for like things that happen would things get handled or do they get handled or how? so you're saying like do basically do white people stand up for us yeah no they don't um at least from my experiences i no they don't it's kind of they pretty much just stay to themselves when like stuff like that happens uh like i'd say would rarely with something like that of like a a white person standing up for a POC would ever happen just because it's so rare and like 
I'd say the most like a white person might like feel or have sympathy, but like nothing would be done as far as like standing up or trying to help or like assisting or guiding uh, a POC through anything that they go through. Do you guys ever talk about race with your white friends? No. No, I don't. I just, I feel uncomfortable because I feel like they're going to say something and it's not going to be the right thing or something that's like triggering towards me, I get, I would say. And it's kind of like, I'm, I might like lash out or like just something like that. Yeah, I feel like uh, in class last year, I had a history class full of white people and there was about four or five black people and we always had this one like group like we just stayed together we would never try to interact or sit with white people and anytime we would ask for help it was always um like a smart it was like a smart or like sarcastic response or it was just like a just do this and then they would like walk off it was like barely any help but if it was their people you know they'd be like you want to see my notes or you know give you all the they, they would give them all the help they need and then with us it'll be like two words I feel like if we were to talk to our white friends about that they would be like uh, I don't really see it or you know they like you and like I, I feel like they wouldn't be able to relate or be able to I don't know just feel for us I feel like they would kind of be like no they're cool like they like kind you. of like they're oblivious yeah all right so I, I don't know about you all, but sometimes when I am listening to things that are really heavy emotionally, I don't realize that I'm, I'm holding my breath. So if you found that you might've been holding your breath, take a breath. Um, and I'd love to hear people share out in the chat, what did you hear? What did you hear? alienation. So we have um, in the chat, um, a, a uncomfortableness, discomfort there, um, uh, calling out a lack of understanding by white people of the issues, um, feeling kind of desolate um, emotion there. Um, uh, these students of colors, uh, concerns being invalidated, um, the, the students not um, being seen or heard, um, feeling isolated, um, lack of trust, frustration. I can't keep up with all these great um, things that people are, are sharing out. Yeah, people, the students not feeling safe and heard or understood, um, feeling trapped and frustrated, excluded. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, lots of really wonderful, deep, radical listening here, really hearing and holding the students' experiences. Um, and I'm gonna give you a little bit of additional context here um, that these these two students um, were uh, student leaders and the um, as probably is not surprising you could hear in his in his confidence in particular the first student who spoke was um, his class president was very involved in everything and um, the context that both of them were talking about was being in um, different AP classes advanced placement classes and having the experience of um, being included in the class um, from a from a push in particular for there to be more students of color in advanced placement classes more black students in advanced placement classes but with the teacher making the assumption that actually they and other black students um, were not going to be the ones taking the exam this heavily weighted exam and so they were not the ones who were going to be invested in right so while part of the class so they were experiencing um the white students in the class um being invested in to to learn everything for this exam for college placement credits the other students the black students felt like um they were kind of dismissed in that space and that the the, the setting that the teacher had set up this dynamic the teacher had set up was also replicated by the students in the class that the students didn't want to share notes they didn't want to um, have their fellow black students in study groups, this type of thing. And we hear from um, the male student that not only he says he very respectfully, and this young man is a very respectful young man, goes to the, the teacher 
and the teacher doesn't quite understand. And the, and the student says, I might've had too soft a touch. You know, he was, he was my teacher. I was trying to be respectful. Um, then he goes to a vice principal, a vice principal who is a black man who tells him in the service of trying, I think, to be positive, but tells them just, just walk it through in his language, just stick it out. It's going to be fine. Right. So also doesn't give the necessary support um, to the student to be able to be able to interrupt privilege in that space. Um, and and so what ends up happening, I'm going to I'm going to end this on a positive note. So, so the students have this this really terrific experience coming in, sharing a variety of their experiences and talking about these everyday experiences of microaggressions, of, of racism that is lived in a very um, mundane way, in a classroom to classroom, hallway to hallway um, kind of a way. Uh, and and so they're they're doing he, you know students starts off and saying you know teachers didn't even know it was um, uh, for Black History Month um, uh, Seattle Public Schools has a Black, a Black Lives Matter at School Week that the students program right and these students were very involved in that programming and so he said they didn't even know it was that week and so this was uh, recorded then the following year he um, he he said um, you know Professor Joseph can you come and lead an assembly and do some of the content that you did with with um, the interrupting privilege group he was this group that met at NAM with uh, you know a variety of community members um, as well as university students and um, I said okay, I'll, I'll come, but I need for you to also co-present with me. Um, part of the research that I do is uh, community-engaged participatory research. And um, with youth, it's usually, they put a Y, it's um, PAR is the acronym, and then with youth, it's Y PAR. And so he and I co-presented. It was amazing. This 2,000-person student assembly, we actually listened to this clip, and he spoke to his experience. And then had a little prompt for teachers to actually work through in their classrooms. So when we talk about what does it mean to interrupt privilege in the everyday, this is what the process is, right? They were, they were living out this process. These two students were living out this process as they were both engaging in conversation together, that they were deeply listening to each other. They were reaching out and trying to create change, right? With the teacher, with the vice principal, when that didn't happen, they didn't give up. They thought, you know what, We're, I'm gonna actually take this to a larger stage and have more people engaged in, um, in listening here. Um, so the, the, the last stage, so I kind of talked you through um, the cycle of interrupting privilege, which is basically, you know, listening differently, sitting with discomfort, figuring out how do you deal with that discomfort, um, uh, speaking differently, engaging in equitable types of dialogue and conversation, and then creating change, right? Carefully creating change. And the, the creating change piece is um, we do it in a supported way um, where students like the students that you heard are partnered up um, for, with each other for conversation, but then often with someone across in a different generation to actually think about how do I create change? And we call these uh, critical friend pairings. And so each of these um, young people would get an older person that they were paired with for, for their critical friendship. And their goal in, in their critical friend partnering was to think about how they could create change in their sphere of influence. So I'm going to, to to prompt you all to do a little bit of this exercise um, that that the students go through, the students and the and the and the um, the community participants of interrupting privilege. So if you think about this, uh, these these series of concentric circles right here, and you have control in the very center, your circle of influence perhaps right afterwards, and then something that you have to absolutely have no control and no influence over. Um, depending on who you are, this might look uh, very different, right? So these high school students experience um, of, of control, influence, and no control will be very different from their parent, perhaps, or their principal, or um, the uh, President Biden, right? This is all going to look different for us. But one thing that's really important is to think about how do we actually work to create change in the everyday, which means thinking about that sphere of influence, that yellow piece right here. To get there, you can think about first, what do you have control over in your lives? And people maybe you can um, put stuff into the chat. 
what are some of the things that you have control over in your life? <laughs> Susan's is my cat, all right. Um, what you say, absolutely, Rachel, right? Um, sometimes it doesn't necessarily feel like that, right? But but you can you can work on that kind of discipline around that. Um, most of the time yourself, um, your actions and choices, your reaction, what I eat, put into my body, your schedule for some people, um, what you're spending money on, um, who you're choosing to work for, um, how you're responding, yeah. Uh, th these are all these are absolutely all um, a part of what what many people feel like is in their sphere of control, which is really personal. Right. I don't see anyone, including their children. I mean, those with children know that they, they are um, they're <laughs> uncontrollable. Right. You don't control your spouse. Right. You don't control even your kind of circle of of, of closest friends. Um, and so that that kind of space of no control, no influence. What what else do you have no control and no influence over in your lives? And it might be a, a point of frustration. These things that um, simply the weather. I mean, I hear uh, Seattleites. Yes, absolutely. What are other things that um, that you world events? Oh my gosh, um, those of you all who, are, who have been watching um, the um, incredible devastation in, um, in Turkey and in Syria, those, those earthquakes, um, and, and thinking about perhaps friends and colleagues with, uh, with, with family um, in Turkey and Syria, it, it's, it's devastating, right? And there, there's nothing that we can do, right? Health insurance, that is real, absolutely. Um, and connected, uh, <laughs> broken medical system, yes, there's, there's a lot of co-signing there. Um, Marcy says, how other people respond, I love that. Yes, absolutely, and there's, there's often a lot of frustration around people wanting to control, I want them to hear me that way, I want them to take this away, right? I want them to respond that way, but of course, we don't control that. We don't control other people's um, feelings and reactions and emotions. Um, and then larger issues, immigration policies, um, politics, um, all of these different things, right? So that's what we don't have control over. So in between those two, we have this space of influence, right? Not control. It's not... Um, uh, not the weather, it's not necessarily uh, uh, healthcare policy, although there might be some people in, in, this, in this room who even might have some influence there. Um, but what do you have influence over? Or who, do you, who might you have influence over? Sue's, uh, your students. Um, if you're, you're a teacher, you're involved in work with, um, with students, your coworkers, um, friends, allies, perhaps administrators, um, uh, colleagues. I like elected officials. I like that. Um, your peers, um, uh, sometimes leadership, colleagues, spouses, children, family, friends. Absolutely. So this, your, your kind of bubble, right? And, that, and that's going to look different for every person. But what we do in Interrupting Privilege is we try and get people to really do kind of a, a, a deep dive into this, this sphere of influence. So to speak in really specific ways for yourself about, um, I don't know, you coach your, um, your child's soccer team, right? Is that, and you're, you are on um, some text lists with the parents around organizing, is there a space that you have kind of a sphere of influence and there's kind of an issue around equity that you wanna work through there. So part of what we're doing is trying to get people to, to understand that change making happens in incremental ways, in small ways, and that it's contagious, right? Um, so thinking about what is your sphere of influence and in all of these little bubbles and pockets and how you can work to shift things. Um, we do this by, setting goals by setting um, very realistic goals. So goals that are first short term, um, which we kind of do a, a timeline for of around, if we're having a program that lasts a, a year, or something we have nine months or three quarter long for us at the university programs. So the first one might be a month. The second one might be about a midterm goal, might be about a quarter long or three months long. And then the third one, the long-term one that you're working towards, um, that you're bringing in 
hopefully other people, other community members in might be a nine months long. So part of this is, is, that, is that you're thinking about um, change making, you're thinking about around issues of equity as, um, as things that, that, you, that you do have some influence and some change making um, abilities over. And, and that that will happen through carefully kind of scripting out your goals and having your buddy, having your critical friend who is there to provide you with feedback, to provide you, provide you with support, to also um, give you some really tough advice sometimes, some things that are might be harder to hear, but that you've signed up for because you want to really be invested in thinking about how do you create change that's about a part of your own identity as well. So this is part of the model, model that, we, that we use here. So I'm going to I'm going to move from here to um, to talking just a little bit about that very first step that you all were doing quite naturally, which is that of radical listening. Um, so radical listening is really the first step of the on the interrupting privilege journey, the first step to kind of thinking about how do you get to that place of, um, of interrupting privilege in, in the everyday. Um, and it means moving from uh, from the kind of the the for for people who um, who have uh, sound that's that's kind of going down our ear canals and and um, is creating some type of messaging from that sound not just being a moment of passive listening right and again for those of you who who have children or perhaps who are teachers you could think about calling someone's name or providing them with instructions a number of times and the person is not responding or not listening. And, um, and then all of a sudden they can, they can pair it back exactly what you've heard, right? That process of passive listening, that is not radical listening, right? And then moving even to the next step that, um, that is active listening. And you all, I'm sure everyone has heard of active listening. Active listening is really about tuning in to your conversation partner, um, ensuring that, that you are doing, um, you know, nonverbal signifying like head nods and, and, and that type of acknowledgement. Um, but what, what active listening doesn't have that radical listening has is the focus on power. So part of what we do in radical listening is to try and hear not just what is being iterated, but to hear the silences. Right to hear the elisions, the moments where people are failing to to tell a story, and to perhaps prompt the, the what's missing, or to wait to learn more about what's missing. Uh, radical listening is also listening um, to history, to structure, to pieces that are um, informing every space. Um, so I, you know, I work with. Um, with, with special education and inclusion, for example. And if they are having um, a meeting with, uh, with a student and families to think about how that student, how that family has been impacted by all of the forces of their education, right? Um, which we know is incredibly racialized, is gendered, is impacted by all of these forces in our world um, about what's happening outside of that, the, that space as well. And to try and hear all of those, those pieces that are floating around in the space um, in a very respectful manner in that, that moment that will feel highly charged and trying to understand why does this feel highly charged? Oh, does it have to do with the fact that um, uh, there was supposed to be a translator here, for example, and no translator showed up. Uh, and so I'm having the, the student have to translate in that space, right? Um, what, 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 are the, what are the tensions that are, that are just arising in this space? Um, and can I kind of hear them in not a way that feels um, defensive, but in a way just to understand? And if you find yourself feeling defensive, that's that discomfort to name that and not let that stop you from moving forward. So this is part of what we do in radical listening. Um, I'm gonna kind of, I wanna be able to stop uh, with, with another clip for you all. So this is just to say that, that there is a, a, a wonderful kind of a, a body of scholarship in a variety of different fields from um, psychology, from rhetoric, from in communication where I am that talks about listening and listening scholarship. Uh, the critical education scholar Joe Kinchlow was the one who coined this phrase. 
And he tells us um, that radical listening is about consciously valuing others by attempting to hear what the speaker is saying for the meaning he or she intends, rather than the meaning the listener interprets through his or her own view of the world. How challenging is that, right? And that's part of the reason that you want to have a buddy to kind of go through this process with and to check you. So uh, radical listening is really, I'm just going to hit a little bit here, is really about slowing down, slowing down that um, implicit bias in particular is activated through speed. So understanding that you are going to jump to assumptions if you are doing things quickly. So trying to introduce time. Um, this is what uh, uh, the psychologist Jennifer, Eber Jennifer Eberhardt talks about as friction and that I kind of demonstrate like this is the heat that's arising, right? When you slow down, but that gives you that moment um, of being able to, to really create some change and to interrupt bias there. Um, it's about engaging in conversations. It's about understanding that you might not be the one if you are the one who's on the upside of power so for example um the teacher uh who might have been played these clips that your role is to really listen and so when you actually engage in conversation after you've listened you say i want to really learn more about what you're telling me right and to ask respectful questions not to be defensive not to try and make excuses that's not the moment that's not what radical listening is about um, and radical thing is really something that's partnered with, with this moment of change making. So we have lots of different clips for you all to listen to on the Interrupting Privilege website that um, you know, are, are intended for everyone to, to hear and to poke around. Um, so Alana put that clip in here. We don't have time to listen to this. These are two, um, but Alana, maybe you could put these clips in there in the chat there so people can, can listen to them later. Uh, so we host these conversations with different people. Um, these two that that uh, that that Alana is going to put in in the in the chat here are around police violence. So um, this is uh, two women who are in their fifties. Um, one of the women who's telling the story is actually um, in quarantine and undergoing um, breast cancer treatment at the time, and she's telling the story um, about her brother and her nephew being um, murdered by the police on the exact same day. 40 years apart. And as she's telling the story to her very good friend, you hear a police siren coming by. Um, that's a, that's a, a, a beautiful, um, intense one. Uh, this one here, we also, we, tr we try and have people from many different positionalities having these conversations. And um, which means that as we're having conversations about police violence, we also actually want to have um, uh, police officers who are there. And um, for this project, we had a number of police officers including this one um, gentleman who was in conversation, um, African-American male police officer in his 50s with a, a female police officer who was actually a higher rank than him. And they talked a little bit about that. Um, but the prompt at this moment, so this is the summer of 2020. Um, and uh, those of you who are in the saddle area, remember the, the kind of the chop and the chat zone. So the occupied spaces that they were going around to, to police and, um, the question was who's taking care of you and and being asked that question um the male police officer um starts crying and says nobody's taking care of me except me and god and so that's what that that clip is about and it was actually his part of him articulating his needs along with other community members that really uh, made us reach out to the resilience lab and want to do some additional work with them but the one that i want to end with is um is a, a different kind of a voice and i realize um alana we're going over just a minute or two but i'd love to be able to play this one um this is a second grade so there, there's it's a conversation between a, a second grade girl and her brother who is in fourth grade and um they these two students are um black and mexican and they were involved in the generation mix project they go to a Spanish immersion school. So you'll hear she calls her uh, her teacher maestra here. And her school does this process of, um, of restorative justice that she talks about as the healing circles. So I'm going to take us to this clip here as we think about 
second graders and what type of um, classroom can be set up for second graders even to engage in interrupting privilege on the everyday. So I'm going to go ahead and start this if you want to turn up the sound on your computer. When you were in English class, somebody said something that black people were and white people were like stuff and mixed people were stuff and so um, it wasn't nice and so we told the teacher and mm. master said that isn't nice you, we gotta have a talk about it so we do circle healing circles in our classes mm. so we have like a bear or something like that and so you can we pass it around and you get a talk mm. and so that's great so so it sounds like there was so people were saying some hurtful things around race but then you all felt comfortable enough to take it to Maestra, right? And then she she addressed it right away, yeah. and that and 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 that you all have this this restorative justice, um, right? That that's what the healing circles are. So the healing circles are where everybody gets up, they go into a circle around the rug, and then so we talk about like how people are being mean and so you look around and see if anybody has a hand up if they their hands up that means that they got hurt by you so you mm. have to say sorry of what you did and then you keep doing that around in a circle so yeah okay what do you guys think of the healing circle so I'll, I'll end the clip there. Um, please do go and, and check it out. Um, there, the conversation with her brother is really, is really beautiful as well. Um, but, you know, I, I really, I love that clip and I love ending with that clip because of really kind of the, the power uh, that the, the teacher had in helping to kind of script this really beautiful egalitarian space in second grade and teaching um, the fundamental lesson that that you can um, acknowledge when you said something wrong and um, and and that that can be a natural and normal thing but we all make mistakes um, sometimes these mistakes that happen around um, questions of race um, of gender, of religion, of disability are, um, are so fraught with people feeling like I can't even acknowledge what just happened because I'm going to be seen as a bad person, right? Um, so how do I even begin having that conversation? And um, these, these second graders, these seven and eight year olds are telling us that, that you practice it every day, how you, how you learn how to have those conversations that create change and create space for everyone is that you practice having them every day. So I'm going to, um, I'm gonna turn it over to you, Alana, and I think we're gonna have a little conversation. Thank you so much, Rolina, for this very powerful and thought-provoking presentation. Um, I invite everyone to please put any questions you have in the Q&A or in the chat. And I, I want to start with one of my own while people are thinking of that. And, and it's kind of a two-part question. This is such hard work, and I imagine it takes such an emotional toll. And I wonder... What has your journey in this professional field been like, and how do you take care of yourself? Well, that's a great question. Um, yeah, so the journey in this professional field, um, I think that, uh, you know, I, I come from, um, like, so much of my work is on mixed race. I come from a, a multiracial background, and I think there's something about the experience of being mixed and um, and hearing and feeling and watching multiple positionalities all the time. I think that's how I came to this work. Uh, my PhD is in ethnic studies. And, um, and I've always been interested in thinking about how do those whose stories are not told, how do they get told? Uh, which I think was the, you know, the, the impetus for all of, for all of my work. Um, in terms of it's, this, this work is really, really challenging. And, and the way that that I um, I try to release um, the pain, especially you, you hear some stories that are incredibly painful, um, is by being in community with folks. I have a, a wonderful circle 
of, um, of friends who um, are kind of similarly positioned to me um, in terms of race and gender who have similar types of roles um, who also are facilitating these conversations. And so we have, I think it's important for everyone, we have a shorthand with each other and, um, and know how to support each other and to hear each other and to help each other um, try, and, um, try and let things go. Uh, which is is absolutely not my my nature. Um, so I'm 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 trying to practice that uh, every day. My my mantra for the year, kind of in lieu of a New Year's resolution, is um, easy breezy, which is the opposite of, of of who I am. But I kind of remind myself as I'm trying to transition from spaces like easy breezy, right? <laughs> Just move through. Um, but it's but it's definitely it's practice. Well, Relina, there's another question here that comes from Debbie who asks, how do you work with resistance or friction when it comes up? Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, and, and friction and resistance is absolutely a part of the work, right? People are uncomfortable, particularly when you're bringing up inequalities that might not be spoken and are gonna push back. Um, it's really, it's really uh, context uh, specific. I do like to name emotion. And so I might say, um, you know, I, 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 I'm hearing right now that this is a really uh, difficult conversation for us to have. And I wanna, I wanna name, name that right now um, as we're moving forward to it. I trust that you are able to be there with me, right? As we're moving forward, um, if that does not work. So, you know, there's all kinds of different strategies. Sometimes um, we'll put it down and then come back to it. So thinking about how do you return to the conversation, um, you know, meaningful conversations around race and its intersections and so many other things don't happen as one-offs. So understanding if someone is at the point of breaking, you don't have to push them until they actually do break, right? You can let someone off the hook and say, can we return to this conversation? Or, or I see that you might need to take care of yourself in this moment, but I'd love to be able for us to continue having the conversation and then figure out how to come back to it in, um, in a way that's really respectful. I think that that's how you help people create change is um, not by kind of hammering at them to change, but rather kind of reading them and, and being soft. Right, um, and that doesn't mean that you're giving up, or that you're not um, that you're not really pushing against inequality, but that you know that sometimes people take a little bit of time. Hmm. Um, another question comes from Rebecca, who asks, "I loved the conversation with the second grader. Are teachers getting this type of training in the education department for when they go into the classroom, so it can be across the board in all schools and with all ages?" That's a great, that's a great question. Um, some, some school districts do have restorative justice that is applied um, kind of district wide or school wide. I know that there were a number of, of schools in the Bay Area um, that received some grants to do this training. Uh, here in the Seattle area, um, when teachers sign up for um, the continuing credit hours, uh, there are different opportunities around restorative justice and how to enact that in a classroom. Because you can imagine with the little ones, it's gonna look very different than with high school students, right? Um, so there are, there are those opportunities, but, but um, uh, you know, like most, at least with public education that we're, we're far more focused on, um, on standards-based work as opposed to thinking about the, the social and emotional space of, of kids, yeah. So the teachers have to have to be kind of looking out for it. So kind of along those same lines, um, is the program that you're doing interrupting privilege, is it available outside of Seattle or outside of Washington State? How can people get involved with that? We're, we are trying, Alana. We've been we've been um, applying for grants with hopes to actually extend the program. Uh, we have some partners in the Philadelphia area who are poised right now. Um, uh, so we're we're hoping in the next couple of years. Um, you mentioned um, NAM, the Northwest African American Museum, and the wonderful director uh, Lanisha Debartelaben, who is our partner with all this work, had the terrific idea of partnering with the um, the Coalition of African American Museums, so that we would have, as we grow into other cities, we would have a partner, a museum partner, a university partner, and then some type of a community group, 
right? Because because mm -hmm. through things like um, you know groups of youth docents, or um, you know there's sometimes organizations that that have some older folks that are also connected to museums, that that would be a nice way to grow. So we're hoping in the next five years or so that will be a part of our plan. That would be amazing. So Relina, in our last minute or two here, what is there something you'd like to leave us with? Some some words of wisdom. Gosh, um, I think my my biggest words of wisdom are around um, just um, not not giving up of mm -hmm. understanding that really um, change making is a, a really incredibly um, difficult uh, lifelong process. Um, that incremental change is still change. Um, but you know, if you if you make the efforts and you feel like you are rebuffed, that you can figure out a way to make another set of efforts around um, around creating change. Uh, and I really I really appreciate everyone for spending their time coming and listening. Um, and I I suspect that your audience is quite well poised to do just that. I love that. Thank you so much, Relina. I also want to say I I really loved how you talked about that you focused on how do the stories that don't get told get told. And I think that's what we can all kind of be listening for also going forward. Like what, what is not being said and, and mm. how, can we, how can we bring that maybe more to the forefront? I'm just, I'm so grateful for the work you're doing. I can't wait to see your new book. Thank you so, so much. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you to all of you who joined today's program today. One of the biggest compliments you can give us is to share this program with a friend or colleague or family member. You can send them a link to this program. Um, it'll be on our website starting tomorrow or invite them to join live on a Tuesday or share it on your social media pages and tag the Holocaust Center. It helps other people to find these programs. And if you're looking for more, join us this afternoon. It's not too late to sign up for the first in a three-part series on teaching about Jews and Judaism. This virtual series will cover the basics of Judaism, the history of anti-Semitism, and the complexities of Jewish American identity. You can find more information and register on our website. And please join us next week for a remarkable story with Reyes Bouillon. Reyes was shot by a white supremacist and he shares his story of resilience and reconciliation, believing strongly that stories have the power to connect, inspire, heal, and even save lives. Our Lunch and Learn programs are possible because of all of you. Thank you to all of those of you who are already members of the Holocaust Center. And if you aren't yet a member, please consider becoming one. Memberships include free unlimited admission for the year and 50% off admission for guests. And you get the wonderful satisfaction of knowing that your gift is supporting education throughout the state of Washington. You can find out more on the Holocaust Center's website just click on membership. Our Lunch and Learn programs are also possible because we have the most amazing team at the Holocaust Center. Thank you to Richard Green, our Museum and Technology Director, who is working behind the scenes to make this program run smoothly. And a huge thank you to our CEO, Dee Simon, and to our entire team, Lori Werschel-Cohen, Paul Regelbrug, Jessica Michaels, Morgan Romero, Amanda Davis, Devonshire Lockey, Katie Lawrence, Branda Anderson, Anna Morris, Demetria Spinrad, and welcome to our newest employee, Lexi Jason. Thank you again to all of you for joining today's program, and we hope to see you at our next Lunch and Learn on February 14th. This concludes our program for today. <laughs>